so welcome everyone. I'm Otilo Slovenczak, um, working for uh, General Electric, and my co-presenter is Victor Schlaufer, working for Nokia. We've been working together on a open stack migration project uh, a year ago, and that's something we are about to talk here. Um, so let's see the starting point. Uh, we had a Rexpiece um, managed uh, open stack environment, roughly 2000 VMs, uh, 500 terabytes of data, and it had a mixed uh, storage environment, so uh, local disk for Nova, um, Glenn, uh, Swift, so object store for Glenn and uh, and Ceph for Cinder. And we didn't have an in-place upgrade option uh, because we it was an insourcing project, so we wanted to manage this OpenStack entirely. Um, hence, we started up a new OpenStack environment inside of the new in the same case into the same data center. Uh, so we had low latency and, and high bandwidth uh, connection between the two environments. And um, the target environment was a Red Hat based uh, OpenStack based on Queens. Uh, so it was P13 and it was an all Ceph uh, environment. So we, of course, we gathered the uh, business requirements before starting up with that. Um, what we had is uh, what, what the requirement was is a full automation. Uh, the reason is very simple. The team is small. Uh, the, the change windows are just very short. So there is no time for improvisation. Everything has to be uh, running automated. And and also if there is something, if something goes wrong or we are just uh, hitting some edge case, uh, we have to roll back. So that's another requirement. Uh, also, we have to preserve the IPs as well. The Macs uh, if, uh, if re, uh, on, on request. Um, and and also the migration is is going for like six months. Um, we are migrating VM by VM. Uh, so uh, if only the half of the application is migrated, those folks has to be able to communicate with each other. So a layer two trunking is, is a requirement here as well. Um, the right sizing, so just like even shrinking the root disk is also important from the storage efficiency point of view. And <clears throat> then the whole migration procedure has to scale out, which means that because we might have some crazy scheduling on, on uh, how many VMs are just migrated, this methodology should, should scale out like, like 100 VMs per day uh, if required. So there shouldn't be any kind of infrastructure or, or process bottleneck here. Uh, which is uh, stopping us to do uh, as much as we can in a short time span. Um, we shouldn't have physical access to the to the original, the source machines, the source hypervisors, because this is a vendor managed product. So it is either a support exception, or we or or we open has to open a ticket for for doing something on on the on the hypervisor. So that's something we cannot really automate. So we should be restricted to the API. Uh, as much as we can. Obviously, again, for the storage efficiency point of view, we have to utilize the, the Ceph uh, copy and write feature as much as we can, so the deduplication features. And because of this is an infrastructure as a service support, we don't really have um, access to the to the operating system, so we cannot really install and we don't want to interfere with the users, uh, if possible, to install something like a local agent. Uh, on the on the machines, so that is also an important part. Scalar is is also a very strong requirement. Uh, like past seventy percent of the of the VMs are managed through Scalar. Scalar is a cloud management platform, and uh, and this is a fair request that they should or they want to uh, manage these environments even uh, uh, via Scalar even after the the migration. And the flexibility, of course, are very important. So whenever it comes uh, in a new feature, uh, a new um, um, edge case, uh, then we have to react on that very uh, uh, fast. Uh, so the whole design should be like uh, plug-in uh, with, uh, with plugins and hooks, and, and also um, <clears throat> we should hold the, the the software in hand, so just to react very fast. Of course, before just reinventing the wheel, we started with some research. So we just uh, examined what would uh, happen if we were uh, copying uh, VMs via copy stack. This is a well-known uh, free tool, tool to migrate workloads between OpenStack environments. And practically, copy stack is uh, would do something like uh, stop the VM, 
create a snapshot into Glance or into Swift practically, and, and we can have to download that snapshot into a staging area and do some uh, crunching on that because of like, first of all, the, we have to convert from Google to row. Uh, because the raw uh, image uh, is a format that is supported by Ceph currently, but also we should do other things like resizing or injecting some scripts or something like that. And once we finish, we have to upload into Glance again, and and when that's done, we can spawn the VM. Um, the whole procedure for a moderate size root disk is taking over an hour, and of course we have like eight to ten times bigger VMs uh, in terms of a root disk, so we that probably takes like four or eight hours to 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 migrate. That's probably too long um, for us. The other thing uh, is that the whole procedure is restricted by Glance. Um, so the Glance uh, and the Swift on the source side and also the Glance on the target side. So uh, this is a bottleneck. Like we cannot do as much as we can at the same time because uh, we are restricted by the network bandwidth of that uh, environment or the load balancer at least. And and also every single VM is having his own image, so that's not really effective from the storage perspective, and and that's that's really a big deal because uh, compared to, to to the scenario what we ended up with and and what would happen if we were using CopyStack, the difference is like 200 terabytes, which is like 600 terabytes row capacity in in SAF, so that's a lot. So. So the reasons reinventing the wheel is the lack of scalar integration, the scalar import, and the, and this kind of far migration stuff is very state of art. Uh, so not uh, not available on on a on an off the shelf tool. Uh, the root disk copy is usually using Glance, which is not good uh, from the uh, well known reasons mentioned previously, and and of course the data duplication is also a problem here. The self, the self integration is also missing. So most of the tools are just trying to be universal, any cloud to any cloud type of migration, which means that they rather <clears throat> clone, copy the, the the volume and do the, do some crunch crunching on that or uh, or uh, migration by their own. But because of we have like Ceph on the both sides, this is practically insane not to use the Ceph provided uh, migration methodology. We also have to develop by uh, uh, an IP collision avoidance tool by your own and and of course the cost is is very uh, important factor here so so you, most of these migration support companies are just uh, doing or providing professional support or just doing something like a cloud migration as a service or disaster recovery as a service um, and um, and and most of the cases, if you are not the most important customer for them, probably you're waiting weeks to to have a fix or to have some new plugins implemented. So that's also important uh, for us. So the tool set, what we um, invented here, is like having a centerpiece of Python scripts that are just managing the migration for images and 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 VMs and volumes. And practically, this is talking to the OpenStack API to 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 uh, change the, the the VM states uh, or or provision new resources. Also, it has a REST proxy piece, which is just orchestrating the Ceph migration or Ceph mirroring. It has an independent port, the porting daemon, which is uh, taking care of I, uh, uh, IPs and and avoiding IP duplications. And we have a REST proxy for Scalar, uh, which is either uh, uh, creating um, the the new constructs or so the new containers for the new in the in the new scalar environment and also managing the states changes uh, of the VMs as well. So so that's and and of course we have a bunch of agents. I told previously that it was a requirement not to have an agent. The trick is that we have uh, uh, these agents in a risk queue image in a risk queue mode. So nothing has to be installed in the on the operating system. So that requirement is satisfied here. So how would you clone the the VMs? Uh, what is the basic uh, idea here? If you just take uh, step four on the bottom of the slide, you can see that there is the, the final uh, point is that we have like a source VM, which is created from a glance snapshot and, and it has a senior volume attached and the requirement is to have a clone of that VM on the other environment, which is just based on the same uh, image and has the same uh, volumes or the clone of those volumes attached. 
So to, in order to achieve the goal, first we have to have the, the snapshot copied to the other side. Um, we are starting with that just to uh, trace back the uh, the parent or the grand grand grandparent of this image. So uh, so this is the base image uh, in step one, and what we are um, uh, what we are doing here is is that taking this base image, we are taking a, creating a temporary VM from this base image on the first side, and and practically we are creating another VM on the target side. From a zero image, zero image is practically a small, tiny image full of zeros, uh, because at that point the base image is nothing to compare, and and we are just transferring everything other than zeros from base image to the to the other sides. And when we when we just make a uh, a snapshot of that temporary V, and we have the clone of the base image, and once we have the base image clone. We can do the same procedure for the snapshot image. So create a temporary VM on the source side, compare the contents of the snapshot to the base image clone, and and finally just do a snapshot of the temporary VM. So we have the snapshot clone. A few days before this whole uh, environment, uh, whole uh, procedure or the, the 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 target window of this this migration, we are just uh, initializing the RBD mirroring uh, for uh, for the attached volumes. And uh, so these steps are practically preparation, and and when the migration window comes, uh, the change window comes, and we are just doing the, the final migration of the root disk, and uh, we are just managing in and and attaching the the volume clones, and we are ready uh, with this uh, migration. <clears throat> of course, if anything goes wrong, the, the original source VM and the original volumes are still on the source side. So the aerobic procedure is very simple. We are just discarding the target VM and we are just getting back or restarting the, the source VM. So what's under the hood? So how the root disk migration workflow is going on? Practically what we can do is, is doing some, um, first of all, our creating or uh, having a rescue image. So that's what I mentioned that we have a, uh, an agent here um, installed. So once you just reboot the machine into this rescue image, then you have these agents started. So this, you can just control uh, the, the streaming from the source to the target uh, VM. And uh, I mentioned that we are comparing the, the checksums practically, or the comparing the target v, uh, target this content to the source we, uh, this content. Um, in order to avoid reading and writing the target list at the same time, uh, by the time we are just making a copy of the source uh, image, we practically be creating a checksum file, which is like generating a checksum, a checksum for each 64 kilobyte chunk. Uh, and and by the time you you come uh, to the point of migration, then you just download that ch uh, checksum file into uh, from an object store into the source VM. So all you have to do is just reading the checksum from the checksum file and calculating the checksum from the root disk. And based on the whether you have a difference or whether it is the same, you are just either transferring the data or you are just instructing the target VM to do a seek on the target disk. So you are practically not storing anything in, in the Ceph layer uh, for that target file. And the final step, of course, doing all these kind of plugins uh, like like fixing files, like fixing the MAC address or fixing something in an ETC FS file or doing any kind of uh, other modifications on the target side and rebooting that machine. And we are happy. Uh, that's uh, how the migration goes. Handing over to Victor. Yeah, so both the environment use Ceph for Cinder volumes, so it was an obvious choice to use RBD mirroring to migrate them from the source OpenStack environment to the destination. RBD mirroring between Ceph clusters of different providers required additional validation before we were comfortable to move forward with this. A Ceph REST proxy tool was also developed to provide an interface to the Ceph clusters so that the VM migration tool could orchestrate the RBD mirroring of our individual RBD images like setting image features required for the mirroring and enabling, disabling the mirroring, and also promoting and demoting the images. The main takeaways of the Ceph RBD mirroring were the following. The true running has an impact on write performance, so it makes sense to enable it just before the migration. Enabling the true running feature may fail if the RBD image has heavy load. In such cases, uh, pausing or shutting down the VM may be the solution. Snapshot of the RBD image are also mirrored, so this is was this was quite useful for us as some of our customers had data retention policies, 
that meant that the snapshots had to be migrated as well. Another consequence of this is that the dependencies between the volumes had to be resolved by flattening some volumes in order to prevent migration scheduling constraints. You can only enable mirroring between pools uh, that have the same name. That's important as well. So this had to be considered when the cinder volume, were, or the volume types were created in the new environment. The last takeaway here is that the RBD mirroring can be a bottleneck as well. In our case, the observed RBD mirroring speed was around two terabytes per hour. And this was only with five RBD images mirroring running in parallel. Okay, the next one is the sports scene demo. The two OpenStack environments uh, were running in parallel for multiple months, and we had a requirement to keep the IP addresses of the migrated instances. So we had layer two trunking between the OpenStack environments to make this possible. As a result of this, we had to find a solution that allowed us to create new Neuton ports on both, both ends without causing an IP MAC address collision. We used a different MAC prefix in the new environment, but we could keep the old MAC addresses as well on the request. For the IP addresses, having non-overlapping allocation pools is only a half solution, as ports with a fixed address can be created without respecting the allocation pool settings. Therefore, we have developed a porting demo that created port clones on the remote end to prevent reusing the same IP address. These cloned ports were then reused during the migration. The last takeaway is that the port ownership needs to be considered here so that the port can be managed by its own later owner later on. Okay, so this slide is about uh, the scalar migration tool and REST proxy that we have developed. The majority of our customers were using OpenStack via scalar cloud management platform, so the migration had to cover seamless transition within their scalar environments. Scalar is a, a hybrid cloud management platform that provides a cloud agnostic definition of the infrastructure with high level primitives like farms, farm roles, roles. Uh, and these scalar resources can be defined in different scopes and the visibility of these different configuration items are also important. Scalar had no support for such farm migration between scalar environments, so we have developed our own tool to take care of this. This was mainly based on the uh, public APIs provided by Scalar. There are a couple of interesting things to mention here. Scalar has its own desired state engine, which means that Scalar tries to converge to its internal known state of the VMs and farms. So the VM lifecycle management had to be done through Scalar. Therefore, we have developed a, a Scalar REST proxy as well to provide a simple API for the VM migration tool to execute lifecycle management ex actions on Scalar instances. External integrations with LDAP servers and DNS had to be considered as well. And these were mainly done via webhook integrations that we had to trigger manually during the migration as again, this was a use case that uh, Scalar wasn't really uh, developed and this is something that we had to trigger ourselves. There was also one interesting tidbit that uh, the private keys for the Scalar farms are generated when a Scalar farm is created, so you have no control of that. This was not good for us because we intended to keep the old private keys and unfortunately this had to be done via Scalar database hex as there was no API for things like this. Okay, so this slide for me. So, um, so how would we use the the tool set after the migration has finished? So, the first obvious way to do that is to do the image copy between the regions. So, we have a monthly obligation to to uh, create a G uh, customized images for for OpenStack, and we are just building that on one platform, and we are copying it to to the other regions, and this is providing an effective copy between the environments. Uh, the the other way uh, or the other thing is a missing feature for OpenStack, so that uh, project migrations or project split and merge is not something that we have embedded into the base OpenStack software. So the migration is practically or uh, the moving uh, VMs between projects is just a simplified migration. So, so we don't we obviously have a migration need within the same region. Uh, that simplifies a bunch of things so we don't have to have port sync we just have to share the networks between the projects and we are moving the fixed ip between the ports and of course we are using volume transfer in the, instead of self migration uh, so that's also uh, simple um have to mention that the snapshots are not transferred so this is something like a takeaway from from that stuff and we are also considering to have something a like region to region migration uh, a uh, Ceph is a is a source pod here, so the VAN connection, the high uh, latency connection, is probably uh, in the way of uh, doing RBD mirroring. So that's a problem. 
And the L2, L2 trunking is also complicated uh, because if your default route is on the original environment, you have to route back everything uh, on this fan connection back to the other region. So some sort of a proximity routing is needed, but that's something uh, probably a challenging one as well. OK, so the lessons learned. So first of all, the migrations can introduce a lot of inefficiencies. And if you don't pay attention, the promise of lowering the IT spending can quickly evaporate. We put in a lot of effort to use the storage efficiently, and it allows us to save us around 200 terabytes of safe storage, which turns uh, out to like 600 uh, terabytes of raw storage. Uh, it's also important to make a quick study before you start developing our own tool. We re realized early on that there is no off-the-shelf tool uh, that meets our business requirements, but the things that we have learned by checking these products help us to come up with our own solution. Uh, we also try to plan everything in advance. Still, there has been a lot of gadgets and edge cases with this amount of workloads uh, that we identified during the migration. So it was really useful that we had the migration tool chain on, under our own control, and it allowed us to adapt our workload quickly to handle non-trivial use cases. Uh, for a longer term project, it's also identified to have uh, these long lead time items at the beginning. So coordinating development with third parties, networking changes, Customers with le less flexible uh, schedules are all long lead time items that may impact the time frame of your whole project. So it's very important to identify these things early on to make sure that you will be able to meet your deadlines. And finally, I would like to say thank you for our team for their contribution on this project. So thank you guys for all the coding, testing, and, and of course doing the migration here. Um, and now it's time for questions.